Coming in at number 10, we have They Might Have Mated With Gorillas. Now, on the first one of these videos, we covered the fact that early humans were deep in the dating game and had no interest in only sleeping with their own species. Thanks to the wonders of science, we've been able to discover that modern humans have traces of other prehistoric humans in their DNA, like Neanderthals and Denisovians. I wonder what Tinder looked like back before we had stone tools. Would you just whip a rock into a crowd and whoever got clocked in the head would be your date? to the prehistoric prom. Now, it would seem that humans took it a step further and might have been hooking up with gorillas. And the evidence to back this up is the fact that humans have two very different kinds of lice on their body. While nearly every other mammal on this planet only has one type of creepy species of lice that likes to rummage through their hair, we have two. We have head lice and we have pubic lice. Can you guess which one of the two species of lice that we have on our bodies is the most similar to the lice found on gorillas? Yeah, it's pubic lice. Yeah, so if you wanted the image of a caveman kissing Harambe on the lips, I just brought it home to you. Coming in at number nine, we have the fact that humans just died off. Now, of course, all the early humans are dead, unless the theories that some of the celebrities we see are immortals who rule the earth from a shadow government are true. But it's not so much that they died off, but that about 80,000 years ago, a bunch of them died off. It was one of the rare times in human history where we saw our numbers drop. I don't know if you've been paying attention to human nature, but we tend to spread faster than a video of Joe Biden tripping up the stairs. But for some reason, there was a force that caused the human population to drop drastically and we have no idea what it was. Now, chances are, it wasn't some war, there wasn't enough of us back then, and we were too stupid to be that organized. One of the more popular theories is that there was a massive volcanic eruption that caused a carpet of ash to cover the skies, which led to freezing temperatures and massive food shortages. Now, this is terrifying because what is stopping that from happening again? Is it someone's job to plug up all the volcanoes or vacuum up the sky with it's covered in smog cloud from hell? My god, I hope so. Coming in number eight, we have they had a wide range of expressions. Let's start with the cute ones before we move on to the dark ones. Humans were the first creatures that could blush, unless there was some dino that had rosy cheeks. But this was a way humans could show other creatures that they meant no harm. If you look into someone's big doe eyes and they have cheeks that are flush, it doesn't really look like they want to kill you. This primal form of expression is how we were able to communicate with other tribes before we could send texts saying, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Now, this wasn't the only way that humans could convey their emotions. There's a reason that showing your teeth and furrowing your brow is a signal of aggression. Early humans most likely had to use this face to tell people that it was time to fight, and it would seem that we never lost that ability. Batman is the perfect representation of brow furrowing still being alive and well today. Coming in at number seven, we have the fact that we lowered our voice box. Now, this wasn't the choice of early humans, it just kind of happened. See, there's something very interesting about humans that seems like a design flaw. When we look at a lot of other primates and monkeys, we find that they have a much higher voice box. Now, this makes it pretty much impossible for them to talk, but it also prevents them from choking. See, because we have a voice box that is so low, it is much easier to choke. So at some point in our evolution, early man started to live a life that prioritized talking over choking to death. Great. Now, to be fair, it is still pretty hard to choke to death. It does happen, but it's not a commonality. Really, we just need to take smaller bites. And to think we chose the small bites so Fergie could one day make for delicious, yeah. I would say that's definitely worth it. Coming in at number six, we have they had a pretty small dating pool. It's great that now you can go on a plethora of dating apps and find your soulmate without even getting out of bed. But back when we were dragging our knuckles through the mud, we weren't so fortunate. It would seem that early humans had to put a lot more effort into finding someone to reproduce with, and there was a lot less of them to do it with. If we're going to look through our genetic diversity, we are going to find something very strange, that we have some of the lowest amount of genetic diversity of any ape. Which makes me wonder, how were we able to make it this far? Well, because we have this information, it leads us to the question of why do humans have such a small pool of genes jiggling around in our bodies? And that is simply because the entire human race probably came from a small tribe in East Africa that was only about 15,000 people. Let me say that again, there's over 7 billion people on this planet, and they are the offspring of a group of 15,000 people. There were 150,000 people just in the suburb I grew up in. Would you really want to be the guy who screwed up on the hunt and then every human in the world would find out that you suck? You would never get a date again. Coming in at 
number five, it's the fact that we crossed the ocean. Here's something crazy. Early humans all started in Africa, and once they decided that they wanted to move out of the original basement, they trekked around the world, and that's how we've been able to cover the world of pizza, K-pop, and fancy clothes. But how the hell did early humans make it to Australia 50,000 years ago? Well, they did it in boats, my dude. They jumped in boats before they even had GPS or a Sudoku book to pass the time. And they set sail to find out who knows what. They crossed the ocean on something that Bear Grylls could have built with a shoestring and some bamboo shoots. I mean, we don't know that for sure, but it would seem that would be the only logical answer as to, as to how they made it there. Which is one of the most impressive feats imaginable. Unless you're a flat earther and you don't believe Australia is real and that everyone on the kangaroo continent is an actor, can we address how stupid that is for a moment? And who was the budget for this and are people writing a script for what goes on down there? Zack Snyder jumped off of the Justice League and farted out the timeline for Australia 2021. Coming in at number four, we have they gave us lower back pain. I mean, they didn't really do this on purpose. There wasn't some early human scientist who was thinking, I hate the future and I want everyone there to suffer and need to see a chiropractor. No, it was much less intentional. See, early humans used to spend their days walking around on all fours like we see with most other primates. They also had to hunt and travel to get food, which was very demanding work, which gave us strong bodies that had thick bones and a posture that was constantly leaning over so we could walk on our hands. Then we, for whatever reason, started to walk upright. I don't know whose idea this was. Whoever thought two legs was better than four is dead wrong. But it's okay because we still had strong muscles and thick bones to support our new lifestyle. But then we invented agriculture and we started to become much more sedentary. So now our bodies are soft and we're walking upright, which puts a ton of stress on our lower back and hips. So unless you're hitting your yoga every other day, you're gonna see your joints wear and tear like the crotch area on your jeans. Why couldn't these dudes just stay down on on their hands so I didn't have to see an osteopath every three weeks. All right, coming in at number three, we have the fact that they were the bringers of death. This should come as a surprise to no one, but humans are very good at killing. It doesn't matter if it's plant life, animal life, human life, or the entire planet itself, we are finding new and inventive ways to create death. And just so you know, this is nothing new. Early humans found so many different ways to hunt and bring destruction. Back then it was more for survival. No one was trophy hunting. But there are tons of tools like clubs, spears, and hatchets that some of our ancestors would use while they were tracking down their prey. Some of the more inventive things that have been discovered are fishing rods and nets. And it would seem that some of the weaponry and hunting tools that early man was able to make was more advanced than we originally thought. Coming in at number two, we have the death throw. I know this sounds like a move from a cheesy kung fu movie, but it was actually one of the key elements that led to Homo sapiens' ability to take over the world. We can throw better and faster than pretty much any other animal on the planet. I'm sure if you trained a chimp to throw a ball its whole life, it could do a better job than a pitcher on sheer strength, but it doesn't come to them naturally. See, humans found out they could whip almost anything like a slug firing out of a shotgun, and this gave us an edge to start taking over. We would first use rocks, but quickly found out that pointy rocks on the end of a stick, aka a spear, would have some of the most stopping power of all time. And coming in at number one, we have cannibalism. So it would seem that not everything ancient humans ate were foliage and animals. There were certain tribes that got so hungry they had to turn to munching on other humans to survive. There's a lot of evidence that shows some human tribes would practice cannibalism and that this isn't just for survival, but a preferred way to live? I guess you could go to war to gain a new territory and then eat all the bodies after. That's what you could call killing two birds with one stone. Well, why did these brutal traditions not make it to the modern era? <laughs> well, other than it being insane and terrifying, cannibalism has some pretty devastating effects on the body. It does a number on the digestive system and can cause the brain to rot. That's where things like mad cow disease came from. Farmers were feeding dead cows to living cows and started a new illness. So most of these human eating humans would have died off because their bodies couldn't manage their destructive lifestyle. I wonder if that's the same for tequila? 
In our number 10 spot today, we have the Masters of Fire. For a long time, it was believed that our prehistoric human ancestors were the ones who discovered fire, but as it turns out, that just isn't true. The evidence now suggests that Homo erectus, which were the first of our ancestors to walk upright and use tools, are actually the ones who can claim the title of Master of Fire. These guys were the first to learn how to produce a controlled flame and really paved the way for us to harness the power that fire can bring. Researchers have found fire pits in Africa that they have been able to date back two million years, which is absolutely wild. We certainly owe a lot to our evolutionary ancestors and all their discoveries, as well as to researchers who help us get a glimpse into what life was like all the way back then. In our number nine spot today, we have blue eyes. We have known for a while that blue eyes are a genetic mutation as we once lived in a world where everyone had brown eyes, but what I didn't know is just how far back this mutation goes. The crazy thing is that every single person today with blue eyes, myself included, can be traced back to one single common ancestor from thousands and thousands of years ago. That is pretty wild when you really think about it. While blue eyes are more rare than we think, it is thought that this trait only survived because of the fact that these blue eyes were seen as highly attractive, which ensured that those with the blue eyes had no trouble finding a partner to procreate with. I'm extremely grateful that things didn't go the opposite way and it wasn't considered a horrendous mutation or that there wasn't some scary belief that those with blue eyes were cursed, because if that was the case, our world would have been a lot different. I mean, at least in terms of eye color. In our number eight spot today, we have relationship transformation. Our early human ancestors lived mostly nomadic lives, but at some point there began to be a transition into a more settled life. With this settlement came agriculture and property, which also means inheritance. This completely changed the way we looked at relationships and procreation. In the more nomadic times, monogamy wasn't really a thing because why? It wouldn't necessarily matter, and it was the norm for both males and females to have multiple sexual partners. The idea of monogamy just didn't really exist, but with the shift of civilization came the shift in this way of thinking. Now that people have homes and things, knowing who your children are becomes a lot more important to people. It's not like this shift happened overnight, but it certainly made quite the change for those who were living during these times. This undoubtedly has affected the way we live our lives and the more modern view of family and relationships. Who knows what our world would look like if this specific change never occurred. In our number seven spot today, we have sharing the earth. Evolution isn't a linear process. This might seem obvious, but it's something that not everyone has taken time to consider. This means that our early human ancestors, the early Homo sapiens, lived on earth with our even earlier evolutionary ancestors, such as the Homo floresiensis, which is more colloquially referred to as the Hobbit. That is absolute insanity to think about. We mostly know about Neanderthals. Thinking about these other hominins existing at the same time is very interesting. It is thought that we continue to live among them as recently as 15,000 years ago. In our number six spot today, we have man's best friend. We all know dogs are man's best friend, but just how far back does this bond go? Well, as it turns out, way farther than you may have thought. Evidence shows that around 15,000 years ago, humans began domesticating wolves, which would eventually lead us to dogs. It is thought that the Eurasian gray wolf was the first of all the wolves to be domesticated, although little is known about why this practice originated. There is speculation that it may have happened unintentionally as the early humans may have shared excess meat with the wolves, which then led to a mutually beneficial relationship or a companionship. Others thought that they were simply domesticated in order to help the early humans hunt. At the end of the day, we may never know for sure, but we do know that the earliest known dog burial dates back to 14,200 years ago. So by that time, dogs were certainly well loved by humans. In our number five spot today, we have travel. Thousands and thousands of years ago, the early humans set out to explore areas of the world that they had not been yet, but this was an extreme challenge for them as it involved crossing the sea. The settlement of Australia is the earliest evidence we have of major sea crossing, and it is considered to be one of the greatest achievements the early humans made. It is, however, unclear if the goal was to reach Australia or if these people just got caught up in wind and waves and luckily arrived on land. It is assumed that the boats used were made out of bamboo, but researchers will likely never know for sure. There is some evidence that suggests that the early humans may have reached Australia as early as 120 
thousand years ago, but we know for sure that it was at least 65,000 years ago, which is still quite a feat. It is highly, highly unlikely that the early humans made it on this voyage on their first try, so we can only imagine how many people lost their lives in an attempt to explore our Earth. Who knows what would have happened if they never took these risks? In our number four spot today, we have the burial practices. Every culture has their own practices for the burial of people who have passed away, and it is usually part of some sort of ceremony or ritual, but this wasn't always necessarily the case. The early humans had quite a wide variety of burial practices, with some burials and graves being extremely lavish and well decorated, with others just being plain. Researchers have found that men were buried more often than women, and infants were only buried very sporadically and sometimes not even at all. Sometimes bodies would be buried with household items or ornaments that they would have worn while still alive, but researchers just can't seem to figure out exactly why there is such a variety in burials. They have said that there seems to be very little rhyme or reason to it, so it may possibly just be one of those things that is destined to be a mystery to us modern humans. In your number three spot today, we have the Neanderthals. For a long time, it was believed that our early human ancestors killed off Neanderthals, which is what led to Homo sapiens taking over, but that is most likely not true at all. Instead, we did interbreed with them, which may have swamped their genetics, but there are some other evolutionary things that may have naturally contributed to the disappearance of Neanderthals. Scientists have been able to come up with a 3D model for what the brain of a Neanderthal would have looked like and have been able to compare that to the brain of an early human. While Neanderthals had bigger skulls, which meant bigger brains, humans have a much larger cerebellum. This is important since the cerebellum is responsible for so much, including movement and balance, to vision and learning, to language, and even mood. This means that we basically just may have had more flexible minds than Neanderthals, which allowed us to progress more quickly. We may have developed better hunting and foraging tactics quicker, as well as being able to develop technology at a higher rate. While we may never know for sure what caused the disappearance of Neanderthals, it is still a question that is highly researched and looked into, so there is a possibility that one day we'll know for sure. In our number two spot today, we have tuberculosis. Tuberculosis has been around for years and has wreaked quite a havoc on our world, but its history goes back farther than we may have thought. The disease was well documented in ancient Egypt as mummies have been found with signs of the bacteria dating back 6,000 years, but scientists have begun being able to trace it back even farther than that to the Neolithic transition. This is the time when humans began taking part in agriculture and began domesticating more animals, and for a while it was believed that tuberculosis may have originated in these animals and then it was passed on to humans. Well, as it turns out, this may not even be the beginning of the disease, as it is now believed that it emerged in humans 70,000 years ago. It is quite a mystery how it has managed to survive this long, as it needs a human host, but it also usually kills the human who is infected with it. But researchers believe that around 20,000 to 30,000 years ago, the bacteria evolved to be able to go dormant in the human host, only to reemerge decades later. This information is not only crazy, but it may help researchers with the fight against the bacteria in our modern society. In our number one spot today, we have the fight for food. In the other parts of these videos, we have talked a lot about the hunting patterns of the early humans, as they obviously did things very differently than we do today. But after scientists were able to piece together what a habitat would have looked like for a human 1.8 million years ago, they have been able to really show what life was like back then. One thing we don't often think about is how much competition there would have been for the early humans to get their food. Without high-powered machinery, humans are certainly knocked down a few pegs in terms of their ability to hunt, and there are other animals on this planet that are much better and naturally equipped. This is what led to there being multiple ways of hunting because it was a highly stressful activity for them. Sometimes it was better to just scavenge what was left over from a large carnivorous predator, as it could be a huge risk going out and hunting your own meat in fear of becoming the meal. The recreation creation of the habitat also led researchers to learn more about the lives of the earliest humans and how they ate and drank. It is also believed that when they did go out to hunt their own meat, they most likely brought it back to safer places in order to feast on their kill. Starting off this countdown, we have geophagy. This is a practice in which early humans would eat dirt in order to heal themselves. It all started when they saw animals eating clay and dirt and they were like, Hmm, if it doesn't make them sick, let's try and eat it as well. Maybe they're eating it for a reason and we should be too. So whenever people were sick, they would eat dirt or clay. 
doubt that it tasted very good and not sure what it really did for their bodies, but they did it. Coming in at number nine, we have the powder of sympathy. This was a form of sympathetic medicine that was used in the 17th century. Basically, this special powder was put on a weapon that inflicted a person a wound and it was said to heal the injury. Yeah, you heard me. The treatment was placed on the weapon, not the actual wound. So the powder was made up of green vitriol that was first dissolved in water and then afterwards recrystallized in the sun. Apparently, the Duke of Buckingham healed his secretary who was suffering from gangrene by soaking his bloody bandage in this solution. I don't know, it just sounds crazy to me. Moving on to number eight, we have the cuts and broken bones. Back in the day, it was fairly common for humans to get scrapes, cuts, or to break their bones. That's because they would have to compete with animals for food, as well as run away from animals who were their natural predators. So if they did get a cut, obviously they didn't have band-aids back then, so they would use mud. Once the wet mud or clay was put on a person's skin, it would dry up and seal the wound. For broken bones, clay was also used. The broken bones were cased in a pot made from mud. It's pretty resourceful if you ask me. In our seventh spot, we have the painkillers. Imagine going through a massive surgery nowadays without painkillers or getting a headache and not being able to cure it with Advil. It would suck pretty badly, right? Well, back in the day, early humans actually had painkillers. They used poplar. Poplar is a plant that contains salicylic acid, which has pain-relieving, anti-inflammatory, and temperature-lowering effects. After studying dental calculus on the teeth of Neanderthals, they found traces of poplar, suggesting they ate this plant in low doses as a painkiller. In our sixth spot, we have the animal cure. So according to the ancient Egyptians, a number of animals had natural curing properties. For example, lizard blood would be used as a topical ointment, whereas dead mice were used as bandages. Not only that, but horse saliva was said to cure a woman's sex drive. So women with a low libido were often doused in horse saliva. How great does that sound? Did it actually work? Who knows? But the Egyptians thought so. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the animal dung. So like I just mentioned, animals were thought to have curing properties. In fact, their poop was thought to be a cure-all. So Egyptian physicians would use donkey, gazelle, dog, and even human dung in their remedies. It was thought to be good for healing and to ward off bad spirits. However, it would seem as if most of the times people would develop tetanus and other infections after using excrement on their body. But believe it or not, research shows that the microflora found in some types of animal feces actually contains antibiotic substances. So uh, there you go. They were definitely onto something there. In our fourth spot, we have corpse medicine. Sounds gross, and that's because it definitely is gross. Back in the day, an elixir was given to people suffering from persistent headaches, muscle cramps, or stomach ulcers. What was in this magic elixir, you say? Well, human flesh, blood, or bone. This was called corpse medicine and was around for hundreds of years. So back in the day, Romans thought the blood of fallen gladiators would cure epilepsy. So when a Roman gladiator lost their life, their blood was collected and then sold as medicine. The Romans believed that the warrior's blood had magical powers. Sometimes they would even take out the warrior's liver and eat them raw. Again, thinking that this would cure them. In the 12th century, people would grind up mummies looted from Egypt and make something called mummy powder, which was also supposed to have healing properties. Now, the type of medicine that you received depended on your ailment. For example, if you suffered from headaches, you'd be given a treatment made out of a dead person's skull. If you had muscle aches, you'd be given human fat, so on and so on. In fact, people would attend executions just so that they could collect a cup of fresh human blood. Moving on to number three, we have the Babylonian skull cure. During ancient Babylonian times, most illnesses were thought to be caused by a demonic entity or were a form of punishment from the gods who were angered by your wrongdoings. Therefore, the doctors back then acted more as priests or exorcists instead of actual doctors. So when people were sick, they would perform magical rituals to cure them. 
For example, let's say that you had a bad habit of grinding your teeth at night. The doctor would then make you sleep by a human skull for a week as a way to exercise the spirit that was causing you to grind your teeth. They thought maybe a spirit was trying to contact you in your sleep. Anyways, this treatment gets even more messed up. Aside from the sleeping next to the skull, the individual had to also kiss and lick the skull seven times each night. Yes, you heard me correctly. I'm just glad that we no longer practice this because I'm constantly grinding my teeth at night. Moving on to number two, we have bloodletting. Thousands of years ago, early humans believed that sickness was a result of bad blood. So what way to cure this than to get rid of the bad blood inside of you? Hence why the practice bloodletting became a thing. It's said that this practice started with the ancient Sumerians and Egyptians, but didn't become a common practice until the classical Greece and Rome time period. Hippocrates and Galen believed that the human body was filled with four substances, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. If they got sick, they believed that that meant that the person had bad blood. So they would cut a person's vein and drain some of the blood. In other cases, they would use leeches to suck the bad blood directly out from their skin, which, you know, obviously it's a risky business to just cut a vein. And as a result, a number of people accidentally bled to death. And in our number one spot today, we have trepanning. Back in the day when people suffered from seizures or migraines or mental health issues, they were treated by a procedure called trepanning which basically involved drilling a hole into the human skull. It's said that this would free the victim of the demon or evil spirits inside of them, causing them these issues. Scientists first discovered this procedure after analyzing cave paintings from the prehistoric people. After the procedure was complete, if the person was still alive, they would actually keep the part of the skull as a good luck charm. This is said to be one of the oldest forms of surgery in history. Mm -hmm.